Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Make sure everything's working. Um, we're going to pick up with, I think, FIT 38 on page 121. <clears throat> it's just after Beowulf has um, told Wheelof to go get some of the uh, treasure that he's won in defeating the dragon so that you know he can die kind of in peace and we're told around 2752 or so and swiftly i've heard the son of weston after these words obeyed his lord sick with wounds wore his ring net blah 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 so we off goes into the mount goes into the barrow and we get an, a description of what he sees 27, 58, 57. Many bright jewels, glittering gold scattered on the ground, wonders on the walls, the lair of that worm, flagon standing, ancient serving vessels without a steward, trappings all moldered. Treasure made easily, line 2764. Treasure made easily, gold in the ground, give the slip to any one of us. Let him hide it who will. And then notice your gloss at the bottom or it can be translated treasure can get the better of any man heed these words who will the old english is uncertain um i guess my question is is it really uncertain because what are what are we being told treasure slash gold slash wealth can do what, or will do what? It will always slip through the hands, it will always slip through the grasp. And what the speaker seems to be saying, what the poet seems to be saying, is the same kind of message or the same kind of idea that we heard in the Wanderer, the Seafarer, to some extent, the Dream of the Rude. And that is that <clears throat> ultimately, gold treasure wealth they get you nothing they they don't buy you anything okay as as the speaker says here you know it'll give the slip try as you hard try as hard as you want to hold on to it ultimately when you die you don't bring anything with you so we're told move these things around a bit 20 top of page 122 2767 or so you know we off season ensign all golden hanging high over the hoard greatest handwork linked together with skill light gleamed from it so that he could see the cave's floor now light gleams from this ensign it's not clear what this ensign is uh, another translation for the word that's, that's translated here, ensign, is standard, right? And, you know, you think of a standard in, in kind of military terms as a pennant, a flag, right? Here it kind of sounds like it's some sort of candle stand. And there are candles on it lighting the inside of the horde. So that kind of begs the question. Why would a dragon have a candle stand lit? Right. So we get more description of everything we love sees. And then we're told 2783 or so. He rushes out. He has an armful of, of treasure. He wants to know whether or not Beowulf is still alive. And he finds him, line 2788. Eight and following, he found the famous prince, his own lord, his life at an end, all bloody. And so, what does he do? Gets some water and he washes off <coughs> Beowulf's face until the point, <coughs> until the point of a word escaped from his breast. And Beowulf speaks <coughs> For all these treasures, I offer thanks with these words to the eternal Lord, the King of Glory, for what I gaze upon here. Okay. that I was able to acquire such wealth for my people before my death day. <clears throat> um, 
now that I have sold, so notice, I was able to acquire such wealth for my people. It's the second time he's, he said this. Now that I have sold my old lifespan for this hoard of treasures, and the idea of sold there is he's made an exchange. He's exchanged his life for these treasures, right? His life spent defending his people for these treasures Beowulf now thinks will be used for the good of his people. Now that I've sold my old life spent for the sword of treasures, they will attend to the needs of the people. I can stay no longer. So this reciprocal exchange, I can't live any longer. These treasures will be spent, maybe given for the good of the people. And yet, what are we going to see happen? That's not what happens. It, it's not an even trade, so to speak, okay? So he, he kind of issues a command. It's not literally a command. He says, you know, have a tomb built for me over my pyre on the cliffs by the sea. It'll be a monument to my people so that seafarers afterwards shall call it Beowulf's burial. So he's telling us what kind of burial he's going to receive. He's, he's going to be burned on a funeral pyre. And he says, and over the ashes, I want this huge barrel raised. <clears throat> and then we're told 2809, the bold-minded nobleman took from his neck a golden circlet and gave it to the thane. Okay? This is a torque that I've mentioned before. It's open on one side, so he can pull it to get it around his neck, and he gives it to Wheelof with these words. So he gives him the torque, he gives him his helmet, and his mail shirt, All right? You are the last survivor of our lineage, the Waymondings. Fate has swept away all of my kinsmen, earls in their courage, to their final destiny. The word that's used translated as fate is weird. I don't understand or don't know why the user doesn't translate. Hold on, let me make sure about that. 2814. Yeah, it's weird. Why Lisa translates weird here as fate and doesn't leave it as weird like he does in some of his other translations. Um, is, is kind of interesting. Fate has swept away all of my kinsmen, earls in their courage, to their final destiny, I must follow them. To their final destiny, to their death, okay? That's what literally is implied. It could also mean to their final judgment, etc. And we're told that was the last word of the old warrior, his final thought before he chose the fire the hot surging flames. What, is, what does that mean, chose the fire? Because some critics have suggested that's referring to Beowulf's final destiny, that is, his final judgment. Because Beowulf is not a Christian, because he's pagan, he's going to hell. I think that's a ludicrous interpretation. It's probably referring to the fire of his funeral. He will be burned on a big old pile of logs and sticks and such, okay? Because then we get the next line and a half. From his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous, okay? Literally, the dome of the truth fast. And Lisa says, an ambiguous pronouncement. It is not clear whether this means that Beowulf's soul will receive the sort of judgment that a righteous soul uh, ought to receive and so go to heaven, or that it will be judged by those fast in truth and so go to hell as an unbaptized pagan. Um, yes and no, okay? Because there are early church fathers 
who do say that there are pagans who go to heaven. And they go to heaven because they do the best with what they know. That is, they follow what St. Paul calls the law of God written upon their hearts. Okay? Beowulf, the character within the poem, makes it fairly clear throughout the poem that although he's not a Christian per se, because he doesn't know about Christ, the, the poem is situated in a world, excuse me, in a locale that has not yet heard about Christ. Northern Germany, the Scandinavian lands, at the time of the world of the poem, mid sixth century or so, Christianity has not reached it yet. Right? So, so they're all pagan. But the character of Beowulf acts and speaks in such a way that he's kind of a proto-Christian, if you want. A pre-Christian. That is, he's kind of following a lot of the dictates, teachings, etc., of Christianity without knowing about Christ. Thus, you know, St. Paul's following the law of God kind of thing. So I think the comment, you know, from his breast flew his soul to seek the judgment of the righteous, that's implying he's going to get a righteous judgment. That is, he's going to be judged righteously, right? And keep in mind, who is saying that? It's not Wheelof, it's not Beowulf. That is the probably Christian poet looking back upon the past, the Inyardagum, okay, in seeing something of worth in this character. And it's probably the Christian poet's judgment that, you know, this guy's probably saved, so to speak. So, fit 39. We're told we off watches Beowulf die. He sees the dragon dead next to him. Right? And we get a description of that. Um, and that, you know, the dragon will no longer fly, et cetera, et cetera. In 2846, it was not long before the other men, the other warriors, the other 11 chosen with Wheelof, come out of the woods. We're told those, sorry, 10, those 10 weak traitors, right? They come out and they see Wheelof. 2852 or so. He sat exhausted at his Lord's shoulder, tried to rouse him with water, but it was no use. So he's not just sitting there mourning. He's, you know, Splashing water on Beowulf's face, trying to get him to wake up. And then we're told, 2864, Wheelof rebukes the other warriors. The man who would speak the truth must say that the Lord who gave you those gifts of treasures, the soldiers trapping to stand in there, when often on the ale benches, he handed out helmets and beernies to the hall sitters, the Lord to his followers, followers whatever he could find, the finest day far and near, this is what the person would say. That all that battle dress he absolutely and entirely threw away when war beset him. Right? So what is Wheelock saying about Beowulf's judge of character? Look at those lines again. The man who would speak the truth must say that the Lord who gave you those gifts of treasures, what? That he absolutely and entirely threw away. He's saying, Beowulf wasted all that treasure that he gave to you. Why? Because when war beset him, that is, in his final need, none of you came to his aid. Our nation's king had no need to boast of his comrades in arms. 
but the ruler of victories allowed that he, along with his blade, ruler of victories, God, allowed that he, along with his blade, might avenge himself when he needed your valor. He's saying Beowulf avenged himself when you should have avenged him. Only a little life protection could I offer him in battle. Notice how Wilaf is diminishing his part. He's saying, I just gave him a few more minutes to live. To support my kinsmen. See, Beowulf wasn't the kinsman of these other men. Or if he was, it was more tenuous. Wheelhoff is saying, I followed that fourfold Germanic ethic, duty to Lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin and or kin. He's saying, I did that. Um, he says, ever the worst, 2880, was the deadly enemy when I struck with my sword, a fire less severe surging from his head, too few supporters thronged around our prince in his great peril. There should have been a shield wall, Wheelof is suggesting, around Beowulf to protect him. Now the getting of treasure, the giving of swords, and all the happy joys of Wheelof land shall end for your race. Empty-handed will you go, every man among your tribe, stripped of land rights, when noblemen learn far and wide of your flight. He's saying, when the Gidish people hear about what you've done, you will be stripped of all your property, of all your wealth. They, those 10 warriors, you will all become exiles. Right? 2890, death is better for any earl than a life of dishonor. And I never made the connection before. Um, but in these lines, it seems to me like there's possibly an allusion to a poem I've mentioned several times, the Battle of Malden. Because as I mentioned before, in the Battle of Malden, um, the old English warrior, and he's an old, old English warrior, Virtnoth, he dies relatively early in battle, and his men form a circle around him, and they die to the last man, defending his body, right? And you have a character say, uh, I don't think that poem is in there. Check something real quick. No, and I don't have it in front of me. You have a character say, you know, heart shall be the st stronger, courage the greater, um, as our strength lessens, right? That's said kind of at the climax of the poem, when the last of the warriors are about to die in the Battle of Malden. But the, the heroes of, of the poem are those who die, you know, uh, defending Birtnoth's body. Birtnoth isn't the hero, right? And you, you kind of get, I think, some of the same mentality here with Wheelof referring to these men as traitors and um, lacking in courage. In the Battle of Malden, one of the reasons the English lose is because a group of warriors ride away from the battle. And, and one of them, one of the warriors, gets on Birtnoth's horse. And the English see them right away. And so they think their lord is leaving. So 
several of them live. And the poet makes it clear, you know, these men will live lives of dishonor from that moment on because word will get out about what they've done. Well, Wheelough says the exact same thing here. It, I just, I can't help but wonder um, if this is an allusion to that. Bear in mind that battle occurred in nine, 991. It's not the poem was written very soon thereafter, maybe 992. Um, we know the manuscript of Beowulf dates from at the earliest 975 and possibly at the latest 1025 or so. So it could very easily, the person who's copying this and or creating the version we have now, according to Kevin Kinnan, um, could have been familiar with the poem, with the Battle of Malden. So, Fit 40. Wheelhoff orders the results of Beowulf's battle with the dragon to be announced to the camp up by the cliff's edge, where that troop of Earl shield bearers sat sad minded all the long morning. Now, this is the first time we get this camp referred to. And I should have um, drawn something so I could put this up. Um, what this is indicating is that when Beowulf and his men leave to fight the dragon, right? Um, a big group leaves, okay? So let's say they start over here, a big group leaves, and then part of it breaks off, right? So this part breaks off, and this group keeps going this way, all right? And then this group separates into wheel off in the other 10, right? And Beowulf keeps going on. So we have Beowulf, wheel off in the other 10, this much larger group. So you could actually say, you know, Beowulf over, where did I go? Beowulf in wheel off, because wheel off joins in. Beowulf alone, wheel off in the others, etc. What? Why am I pointing this out? It's very similar to what we get at the crucifixion, right? Because what do you what do you have in the crucifixion of Christ? How many disciples? Christ and the Apostle John, right? Christ says to John, you know, behold your mother, woman, behold your son. He gives John charge of taking care of Mary, right? Where are the other disciples? They're not around. They're like this group back here, the camp, right? That don't witness, you know, what happens at the, at the crucifixion. It's also similar to, if, if you look at the life of Christ, you've got Christ and you've got a smaller group of apostles, Peter, James, and John, who, you know, see the transfiguration on the Mount of Transfiguration. They go off alone with him to pray at times, you know, Garden of Gethsemane, for example, Peter, James, and John separate, you know, and then Christ separates away from them. So you have, you know, in the garden, you've got Christ, Peter, James, and John, who've gone off with Christ, and then Christ departs, and then you have the rest of the apostles. So you have this, this image of, you know, the one person being alone, and then a smaller group, and then a larger group. Well, Wheelhoff orders were to be taken to this larger camp, okay? And so we get the word of the messenger, lines 2,900 and following. And these are the words, apparently, that Wheelhoff tells the messenger to bring to the camp of the Geats. Right? Now is the joy giver of the Geatish people, the Lord of the Weathers, laid on his deathbed, holding a place of slaughter by the serpent's deeds. So they are told, Beowulf is dead, the dragon is dead. All right? 2906. Wheelhoff sits Weston's offspring over Beowulf. And notice how the messenger brings in Weston. He does that 
because of what is going to be said subsequently. He sits over Beowulf, one Earl over the other, now dead. He holds with his desperate heart the watch over friend and foe. Now this folk, that is, this tribal entity, <clears throat> this group of people, the Geats, may expect a time of trouble. Why? When this is told to the Frisian, to the Franks and Frisians, what's the this? What does the demonstrative pronoun this refer to? That Beowulf is dead and Wilaf now is king, right? The strife was begun hard with the Hugas after Helot came traveling with his ships to the shores of Frisia. And this is the third reference to Helot's Frisian raid. All right. So what's the messenger suggesting? Helak opened a feud with the Frisian people when he attacked them. Even though Helak died in that Frisian raid, Beowulf survived, went back to the land of the Geats, ruled for 50 years. He's now dead. Wilof is now the king. Sorry, just lost the computer there. Wilof is now king. So what's going to happen? The feud that has seemingly been in abeyance for 50 years, it's now going to open up again, okay? So he goes on. So we're gonna have the, the Frisians want to attack the Geats, 2922 nor do I expect any peace or truce from the Swedish nation. It has been well known that Anjim Dao ended the life of Havkin, son of Hrethel, when in their arrogant pride, the Giedish people first sought out the battle Shilvings. Right? So Helak opened a feud with the Frisians, and here we're told in their arrogant pride, 2926, just curious. I was wondering if that was over mode, but it's not. Um, he said, because of the arrogant pride, the Giedish people opened a feud with what? With the Swedes, okay? So the Geats and the person of Helak opened a feud with the Frisians, and then the person of Hathkin opened a feud with the Swedes, okay? The feud, both those feuds have kind of been in a, you know, let's call it a, a Cold War period while Beowulf was king. Why? Because he's Beowulf. Nobody wants to try to take on Beowulf because he's a monster killer. And we're told um, 2928, immediately the ancient father of Othra, that's Onyantel, king of the Swedes, old and terrifying, returned the attack. The old warrior cut down the sea captain, that's Hathkin, rescued his wife, bereft of her gold. That's that line I referred to earlier, right? Anya Diao rescued his wife. She'd been kidnapped, apparently, by Hathkin. Um, and Hathkin bereft her of her gold. Now, you can read that literally, he stole her treasure, or you can read it suggestively, which I think is what the poem is implying, which means he raped her. He kidnapped her as a sex slave, right? And then the poet reminds us that Anya Thou's wife is <coughs> Onala's and Otara's mother, 
right? They hunted down his deadly enemies, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, um, Helak came, end of that fit. Helak came, avenged his brother's death, and we get to fit 41. The bloody swath of the Swedes and Geats, the slaughter of men was easily seen, how the folk had stirred up feud between them. That good man, this is Onion Tao, then departed old desperate, the Earl, you know, Onion Tao turned farther away, that is, he died. He had heard a proud helix, prowess in battle, war skill, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to skip a bunch. Um, and we're going to pick up with 2970. Uh, hold on. I'm going to skip a bunch. If you hear about how Onion Thiao dies and pick up with uh, 2999. Okay. So all that passage from essentially 2946 through just about 3000 is about the old Swedish war, the hot Swedish war between Hathkin and Hialak and Onion Thiao and his sons and such. So we get to 2999. This is this is why the messenger told all that story. That is the feud and the fierce enmity, savage hatred of men that I expect now when the Swedish people <coughs> seek us out after they have learned that our Lord has perished who had once protected his horde and kingdom against all hostility after the fall of heroes, the valiant shielding, worked for the people's good, and what is more, performed noble deeds. He brings all that up to say, now, once word gets out, once word is taken down to the Frisians, because the Frisians live southwest of the Geats, and word is taken to the Swedes, who live northeast of the Geats, he says, the feud will be renewed, right? While Beowulf was king, we lived in peace. Now we must hurry, 3007, and look upon our people's king and go with him who gave us um, rings on the way to the pyre. No small port of the horde shall burn with that brave man. That's Lytotis. What's meant by no small part? We're going to burn it all. Everything that's in the horde, everything that Beowulf says he died for to purchase for the people, the messenger is telling us, is going to be put on the funeral pyre with Beowulf's body. Countless gold treasures grimly purchased here at last with his own life paid for. Then the flame shall devour, line 3015, the fire unfold. Let no warrior wear treasures for remembrance, nor no fair maiden have a ring ornament around her neck. But sad in mind, stripped of gold, she must walk a foreign path. All the treasure is going to be burned. And notice what he says. The fair maidens will walk a foreign path, not once, but often. Why? Mm -hmm. What was Hrothgar's wife's name? Well, Thal. Well, foreign exile, Thal, servant. Foreign servant, exiled servant. The speaker is suggesting the women of the Gidish nation are, are also going to be foreigners. They're going to be exiles. Right? Why? Because the Geats are going to be destroyed. She must walk a foreign path not once but often. Now that leader of our troop has laid aside laughter, his mirth, and joy. In other words, the Geatish people were safe while Beowulf was alive. Now that he's dead, 
they have no safety. So Beowulf thinks he's bought them more years of peace because of all the treasure he won. Thus many a cold morning shall the spear be grasped in frozen fingers, hefted by hands. He's talking about the Gidish warriors <clears throat> are going to be armed all the time. And the spear will be grasped in frozen fingers because they're not going to have the joys of a warm hall. They're going to be camping in the wild because they're always going to be on the move, looking out for where the next attack is going to come from. But the dark raven, greedy for carrion, shall speak a great deal. Ask the eagle how he fared at his feast when he plundered corpses with, excuse me, the wolf. The three beasts of battle, the raven, the wolf, and the eagle. Why? Because they plunder corpses. He doesn't come out explicitly and say, all the geats are going to die, but he very implicitly suggests it. Thus that brave speaker was speaking a most unlovely truth, right? That is the narrator of the poem saying that about what the messenger said. <clears throat> he did not lie much in words or facts. That's Lytotes. He didn't lie at all. Why? Why does a narrator, okay, call it, if you want, the 10th century speaker of the poem, why does, the, why does he say that? Little historical fact. By the 10th century, 1000 AD, there were no longer any, quote unquote, Gitish people. There was no longer a Gitish nation. We don't know what happened to it. We do know that in the 5th and 6th century, there were people called the Geats. By the 10th century, there were not. Okay. So the people get up. <coughs> oh, oh. <coughs> he is hurt. They go down, they find Beowulf's body, they find the dragon's body. Okay. We're told here is the dragon. 3042, we're told he was 50 feet long. It's not what the old English actually says. The old English actually says 3042, that he was 50 foot yamerches, 50 foot steps. Now, you can take that to be 50 feet if you think of a footstep as being heel to toe, heel to toe kind of thing, or it's 50 paces. You know, and a pace can be anywhere, depending on one's leg length, anywhere from two to three feet. So the dragon can be anywhere from 50 feet. 250 feet long, okay? So they push the dragon off into the ocean and, you know, they start pulling out all the treasure and lay it beside Beowulf. And we're told, <clears throat> 3047, I've got to go quickly. Cups and vessels stood beside him, plates lay there, precious swords, eaten through with rest, as if in the bosom of the earth they had lain for a thousand winters, because they had, all that inheritance was deeply enchanted. The gold of the ancients was gripped in a spell so that, this is what the spell says, so that no man in the world would be able to touch that ring hall unless God himself, the true king of victories, protector of men, granted to whomever he wished to open the hoard to whatever person seemed proper to him. So what does that enchantment mean? It means 
nobody could touch the horde unless God gave that person the ability to, right? So does that mean that because Beowulf was able to kill the dragon, God gave Beowulf that ability? Or does it mean anybody who touched the horde without God's approval is damned? The, the critics who read the poem from kind of a Christian allegorical, allegorical perspective tend to say Beowulf was damned because he touched the horde, okay? So we're told, uh, 50, 42, then it was plain that the journey did not profit the one who had wrongfully hidden under a wall that great treasure, talking about the dragon, okay? Um, let's see here. Um, top of 126. That feud was swiftly avenged. It is a wonder to say where a valiant earl should meet the end of the span of life when he may no longer dwell in the meat hall, a man with his kinsmen. Okay, it is a wonder to say means it's a question. We don't know. Our valiant Earl should meet the end of his span of life when he may no longer dwell in the meat hall. The, the, the speaker is saying, we don't know how our lives will end. So it was with Beowulf when he sought the Barrow's guardian and a hostile fight. Even he did not know how his parting from life should come to pass. Since until doomsday, mighty princes had deeply pronounced when they placed it there that the man who plundered that place would be carried by hostile demons. Now the poet, the poet says, the treasure is damned, okay? And the poet says, and even Beowulf didn't know how his end would come, okay? The man who plundered that place, 3071, would be harried by hostile demons fast in hellish bonds, okay? That's pretty Christian language. This person is going to be bound in hell, grievously tortured, guilty of sins, unless the owner's grace, owner, that's God, 3074. 3074. Yeah, and the word definitely is owner, agendas, or ayendas, okay? Unless the owner's grace had earlier more readily favored the one eager for gold. And you've got a footnote, the Old English text is corrupt. The precise meaning of the passage is not certain. He says, Lisa says, I've tried to incorporate several different interpretations, right? So unless God favored the one who sought the gold, that person is damned, okay? Now, why did Beowulf say he wanted one of the gold? So the, the Christian allegorical interpretation is he wanted it for himself. And thus he suffered from the sin of avarice, right? Uh, Paul in his, I think, second letter to Timothy in the Latin translation, um, trying to remember what it is, uh, cupiditas ex radix malora. Cupiditas, avarice, is the root of all evils, right? Desire for wealth is the root of all evils, according to that passage from St. Paul. But notice the speaker says, the, the poet says, if God allowed it, then the person's not damned. So we often speak. Uh, a little over 10 minutes. Um, Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man. St. Paul says, just as through one man, many men die, Adam, or just as through one man, all men die, okay? This is we off now using this language. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man, as we have now seen. Well, what, what's he getting at? you could read that 
and think, oh, the one man is the thief. The thief took the cup, woke up the dragon, the dragon burned everything, Beowulf thought he had to fight the dragon, Beowulf died killing the dragon. So many earls suffered because of one man, the thief. But Wheelof, in its following words, are going to imply it's not the thief. We could not persuade our dear prince, shepherd of a kingdom, and what is a shepherd supposed to do? Protect the sheep. What's the, what, what are the sheep? The kingdom. The king is supposed to protect, defend the people, right? Our, we cannot persuade our dear prince with any counsel that he should not greet that old gold guardian. That is, we couldn't persuade him not to fight the dragon. We couldn't persuade him to let him, the dragon, lie there we had, where he long had been, inhabit the dwellings until the end of the world, he held to his high destiny. What's Wheelof saying? He's saying, we tried to persuade Beowulf, let the dragon lie. Why? What had the dragon apparently done after the cup was discovered stolen and he'd gone out and torched the surrounding countryside? The dragon had gone back into the barrow and gone back to sleep. Wheelock is saying, we couldn't persuade Beowulf to let sleeping dragons lie. What did Beowulf have to do to fight the dragon? He had to wake it up. The dragon, theoretically, would have slept for how long? It slept for 300 winters before. That is, the dragon found the horde and then did what? Slept for 300 years on it until the cup was stolen. The dragon after the cup was stolen, went back to sleep. Implication, it would have slept another 300 years. Beowulf could have died peacefully in his sleep. But that's one of the things Hrothgar warns against in his homily, right? No, Wheelof says, 3084, he held to his high destiny. What is Beowulf? First and foremost, king? No, monster killer. So Wheelof says, the horde is opened, grimly gotten. Why grimly? Beowulf paid for it with his life. And because Beowulf paid for it with his life, what's going to happen to the Geats? Go back to the messenger's message. We are going to pay for it. The fate was too great, which impelled the king of our people to thither. I was in there, I looked over it all. Okay. So what does he say? I grabbed all the treasure, I brought it out. Baal was still conscious. He spoke of many things. He ordered a barrow to be built. Let's not waste time. 3101. Let us now make haste for one more time to see and seek out that store of cunning gems. Let's go get it all. Okay. Then let us bear 3107, our beloved Lord, that dear man to where he must long rest in the keeping of the ruler, God. Then the son of Weston, the brave battle warrior, let it be made known, okay? And so they burned Beowulf. 3120, then the wise son of Weston. Notice how the speaker keeps emphasizing how Wheelof is the son of Weston. Why? What is West on significance? He's the slayer of Anmund, the speaker told us previous, previously. Right? Eadgils is now the king of the Swedes. When word comes back to the Swedes that Beowulf is dead and Wheelof is king, 
Angels, the brother of the dead Anmon, the son of the dead Othera, is going to seek vengeance because of the feud. The feud that was opened by Wheelof's father, Weston, right, with Angels when he killed Anmon, Angels' brother. And when he aided Onala against, apparently, Uthra, Angels' father. So they build the big funeral pyre, Fit 43. They ride around, they sing. We're told the roaring fire, line 3145, mingles with weeping, with heavy spirits, 3148. They mourn their despair, the death of the Lord, a sorrowful song, sang the Gadish woman. And there's, there's damage in the manuscript here. This is the last page. There's missing words, there's holes, et cetera, et cetera. 3156, then the waiter people rot for him, a barrel on the headland. That is, they bury Beowulf's ashes in all the melted treasure, and they put a big old barrel over it, okay? They place rings and bright jewels, all the trappings that those reckless men had seized from the horde before. Why are they reckless? Because the poet told us all that treasure was damned. So anybody who touched it was damned also. And they put it in the ground, 3167, where it yet remains just as useless to men as it was before. J.R.R. Tolkien in his essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, said all of Old English literature is about one thing, the death of man and all of his works. All his works is this, gold is useless, right? Period. It doesn't do us ultimately any good. Right? That's possible one meaning. Or it's useless where? Buried in the ground. Or to put it another way, in a horde. Think, what, what's the modern version of a horde? A big old massive bank account or stock holdings. What's the purpose of gold? What should be done with it? It should be distributed. It should be shared. It should be used. See, Beowulf thought he bought the gold so it would be distributed to the people. And instead, it gets put back in the ground where it's of no use. Because what can you do with gold? You can purchase things. You can trade things. You can get food. You can get warmth. You can get protection. Right? So they bury him. They ride around his barrow. And we're told, last three lines. 3180. They said that he was of all the kings of the world, the mildest of men and the most gentle, the kindest to his folk and the most eager for fame. Right? Three of those four things that he's praised for are entirely Christian. One of them is often understood to be entirely pagan and Germanic. Right? Mildest of men, that is not a pagan Germanic virtue. Most gentle is not a pagan Germanic virtue. Kindest to his people. Yeah, possibly. Depends on what you mean by kind. Kind could mean the most natural. Right? That is, he behaves the most humanly to his people. It could also mean kind as in the modern sense, nicest, right? Most eager for fame, lofiornost, 
L-O-F-G-E-O-R-N-O-S-T is that word. And the, the people who read the poem via Christian allegory, they say, by ending the poem with that, it shows, ah, Beowulf is full of pride. He was most eager for fame. That's why he's damned. No, because there's another, there is a Christian version of fame. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, St. Paul writes, is the kind of word all Christians want to receive from God. It's that kind of thing, right? Or that's possibly it. Okay, we will stop there. I'll, um, I'll put up a quiz. Wait, will I put up a quiz for the last bit of Beowulf? No, I'll probably just put up the old English exam. Um, that will go up today, tomorrow at the latest and will be due Sunday by 11.59 p.m. That's this coming Sunday, which is the 17th, I believe. All right. Stop recording.